Hospital in 1994 and was on the faculty of the MIT Sloan School of Management until 2002. He's the non-executive chairman of the Brand Inside and co-founder of Compasso. For the past 21 years, he has advised and taught executives from high-tech startups to over 30 of the global Fortune 500 companies. As well as advising in the commercial world, Professor Tavasoli has written over 40 research articles, which during last year included employee-based brand equity, why firms with strong brands pay their executives less, the influence of selective attention and inattention to products on subsequent choice, product failure is a moment of truth, and firing up your neurons of choice. Nada is a recipient of the London Business School's prestigious Excellence in Teaching Award and teaches on our flagship executive programs, the Senior Executive Program and the Transition into General Management. Details of these courses and Professor Tavasoli's other pub publications are of course on our website and contact details for more information will be posted at the end of this webinar. I shall now hand over to Professor Nada Tavasoli. Okay, hello everyone. It's, uh, it's a lovely afternoon here in London and um, the topic of the webinar today uh, is entitled Gaining Brand Traction and as you'll see the word traction I've highlighted the action part and uh, what I'm going to do in this webinar is give you a little bit of an overview of my philosophy of branding which is probably slightly different from how you think about branding traditionally. So um, brand traction, um, I won't go through each of these steps in detail, but uh, there are seven steps I'd like to highlight as part of this webinar, and I'll be illustrating them with various examples. Step number one, uh, which is probably fairly obvious to everyone who has ever gone through any change management process, it's got to be top-led, uh, which means you need a vision from the top. You need to have buy-in, and most importantly, and which is probably slightly different here, you need to have top level involvement in the process. And I'll be giving some examples of this um, as said. Uh, the second step is really about a view from the trenches. It's about starting the whole process by um, looking at frontline employees, looking at customers, and really having an outside in perspective in order to get the process started. The third step I called connecting the dots. And that's really about the idea that we have various codes floating around the organization. We have a vision, mission statement, we have brand values, we have corporate values, we have a leadership model, we have all kinds of different codes. And um, they're often created rather independently and worst of all, they might be somewhat generic in nature. And the idea here is to really connect them around um, brand uh, really being at the center. We then talk about, which is maybe kind of the linchpin in this whole model, is uh, what I call brand acts at moments that matter. And that's really about a customer experience which is not just satisfying, but one which expresses the brand. And of course, there's thousands of um, possible ways you can express the brands along the customer journey. But it's really about identifying which are the real moments that matter to the customers that offer the opportunity to deliver the brand. And just to highlight, you know, one of the differences here is um, we traditionally think of, of brand building maybe through um, communications and advertising, but of course each of these touch points is manned, um, or many of them are manned by uh, our own people, and they are the ones who through their own actions actually are the ones who deliver the brand. Following that I have the step called brand engagement, which again is a different flavor of what we might uh, know as employee engagement. You might be using Gallup's Q12 or some other kind of metric, um, but really they have been designed to create some generic measurement system so you can benchmark yourself around the world. Um, but you know, some of the, the Q12 questions might be, I have a best friend at work, which might give you an idea of how engaged the employee is. But what my research shows, it's not so much as how engaged you are at work, it's really about how engaged you are with a brand, because that's the value you deliver to the customers. Um, not whether you're happy or not so happy at work. 
And um, some of my research actually shows that um, the people who deliver a great brand experience, um, they're not really the ones who are most or least engaged. They could be at any level of engagement in the generic sense. Okay. Uh, step number six is brand practices. And today I'll be focusing on our HR processes, which really um, can become much more powerful by being adapted to uh, the brand. So it's not so much about instituting new practices into your, into your management, but it's about adapting them. So they reflect your strategy and that they reflect the value you're trying to provide to your customers. Step seven, um, and this is probably a mouthful, um, especially if you're not a native English speaker of English, like I am, I mean, I'm not a native speaker, and I call it differentiated tandem metrics. And uh, the, the two words differentiated, uh, one is that really, they have to be on brand, these metrics. Again, um, many of you will be subscribing to third-party services which measure your brand equity, but they're quite generic in nature. Again, for the, for the purpose of comparing yourself to maybe your competitors. But the differentiated part really is a call to including measures that are absolutely specific to your brand, to the things you want to be and the things you don't want to be. By tandem, this is really, um, if you think about the idea of a closed feedback loop, it's about having the touch points measured both from the customer side and the employee side and connecting those two. Because only that way can you figure out how to actually facilitate change. So that's the list. And I'm not going to, each one of these could be a whole lecture of three hours in one of my courses. But what I'm going to do is just give you three examples to give you a flavor of what these things uh, might mean in practice. And hopefully, they'll inspire you and keep you on the line, because I have a bet going uh, about the percentage I have uh, of people online at the end of this. And if at least half of you stay on, I will get a bottle of champagne. So uh, let's keep going. So the, the first step was uh, kind of this idea of um, top lead. And the examples I've chosen reflect I would say three examples of how people think or how organizations think about creating value. And they're quite distinct. And in a historical context, um, if, if you go through these um, three different value uh, levers, the first one I call efficiency, the second one effectiveness, and the third experience. And just to put it into context, the efficiency aspect uh, has dominated business thinking um, you know, from the Industrial Revolution all the way up to, I would say, the 1950s, where the constraints in business were really about um, being able to create supply. And we thought of the supply chain um, along that journey. We thought about spe specialization, a journey uh, from product, from raw material to the retail outlet. And that was all about cutting costs. Then things changed. I'd say about 60 years ago, and the game really was on for effectiveness. It was not the case where demand outstripped supply. You had to compete for demand, and um, that was really the age of innovation and differentiation. But as I'll, I'll show is, even that has kind of come to an end. It is very difficult to differentiate yourselves on the product level. And I'd say the last 10 years or so have increasingly been the age of experience. And in some sense, that's where um, the framework I'm talking about um, really does come into its own. It's about creating those experiences for customers that differentiate you. It doesn't mean efficiency and effectiveness aren't important. It's just that they no longer differentiate you. You have to have them to compete, but they don't set you apart. So let's, uh, let's think about the first one, efficiency, uh, for a second here. So uh, here's a, a survey of, of CEOs. This is about 1,300 CEOs. And I've highlighted the figure there. This is the front cover. This is PwC survey. And it says 82% of organizations want to change their customer-facing strategies. Now, that's all and well. Um, let's see, though, how, when we open up the report, how companies are thinking about this. Early on, uh, one of the questions is asked, you know, which one of these stakeholders has a significant influence on your business strategy. And a whooping 80% of CEOs have, you know, have said you know, customers are you know, highly significant, not just a little bit, but highly significant when it comes to shaping strategy. Now, that's encouraging. Um, and it's, you know, if you think about competition, it's, it's at 45%. Uh, 
um, and employees and partners, um, you know, not too shabby either. But this is what CEOs say. When you go through this report and then you see what they actually do, when they're asked about what are the major initiatives, um, this is the order. 70% of CEOs have implemented a cost reduction initiative. Now, keep in mind, this is, you know, at the back end of a global recession, of the Great Recession. Um, it's probably the fifth or sixth year there's a major cost-cutting initiative in these organizations. And we really are cutting not just into the flesh, but maybe into the bone um, in terms of cost-cutting. And the other two, if you look at the third one, 31% say um, there's going to be an outsourcing of business processes or functions. You know what? In many cases, that again is a way to think about reducing costs. So there's a major focus on costs. But of course, only one of you in the industry can be the, you know, the cost leader, if you will. But in terms of branding, the cost gurus are actually fantastic. You know, re-engineering the corporation, major bestseller. I think most of you can read Greek, uh, Greek Six Sigma, uh, TQM, Total Quality Management. And some of you can even read Japanese because that says Kaizen. Now, all of these are processes which are not designed just to cut costs, but in practice, that's exactly what they are. They're cost-cutting initiatives. So let me show you some of the problems here. So here we have just a chart. Imagine this is the Great Recession I just talked about. And uh, this is an engagement I had with a large multinational um, financial corporation. Now, for them, they, they're in the business of cross-selling. This is a major driver of not just revenues, but of profitability. Um, one of the brand values, because they're about being experts, it was about we listen. Now, if you think about which behavior um, you know, would fit this, well, in this case, we've got um, in the call center, it's calls per hour. So think about the disconnect here. And this is about connecting the dots in some sense. Right? Our, our business model is about cross-selling, our brand is about listening, yet we reward our employees for getting rid of the customers as quickly as possible. The same organization um, had a corporate value of integrity and another brand value which was around trust, which was badly damaged uh, during the financial crisis. Yet when I was at their corporate training uh, headquarters where they send executives, not criminals, well some of them might be, but executives, um, and they had these types of coat hangers. These are nail hook coat hangers, which are, of course, there to um, prevent theft. Or at least if you steal them, they won't be so useful um, back, uh, back at home. So um, if you think about this disconnect between business brand and behavior, if you have an overt cost focus which dominates organizations, it's very hard to actually deliver on a customer-facing um, brand, unless you are the low-cost uh, leader, and that's the only reason why people buy you. So that's the disconnect on the cost side. This is um, Oscar Wilde's uh, quote, which I am very fond of. And uh, in one of his books, he asks, you know, who is a cynic? And the answer is a man who knows the price or the cost of everything and the value of nothing. So the example I'd like to give you is actually one um, I thought of an a commodity market, because some of you might be saying, well, this is all good and well for, you know, maybe Disney or some of those um, you know, really high-end consumer products uh, to get away from a cost focus. But here's Hound Gas in Hong Kong. And here's just an idea of some of the customer touch points. These are touch points, you might say, along the customer journey. And um, these, of course, are manned by people. And the cost focus, and, and by the way, they, they have about 3 million customers, and they touch them about 12 million times a year, so about four times each per customer each year. Now, what they've done, this is an example of one of the apps they developed first, one of their first apps, is, um, you know, you can read your own meter. Fantastic. Um, it's probably good for the customer. They don't have to be there to open the door for someone, but it, the main purpose was to reduce costs. So that, that was the focus of the, co uh, the company. Now, they're in a market where their main competitor is electricity, and um, they're also in a market which, like most markets in the world, might be deregulated. So top-level management thought, you know, the cost game certainly is not going to protect us in the future. So what can we do? And the first step was really to understand um, 
their, their core customers. And they'd never really asked the question, well, where do we make most of our money? And it turns out, this is not a surprise to anybody who loves to cook, that most of their um, customers that are consuming most of the gas, rather than electricity, let's say, they love cooking. And especially if you've been to Hong Kong, you can think of those great, you know, cast iron woks, lots of heat, um, you know, fantastic food. Um, for those of you who haven't had your lunch, this is probably not the best example. I haven't. Um, so I'm going to talk even faster from now on. But the point was that this realization that this was about cooking really gave them an idea of saying, well, of course, costs are important for our revenue or our profit model. But what else can we do with these customers? And critically, instead of thinking about reducing costs through our people, how can we take our people and get them to actually be the agents of change? So all those people who are on the phone, the people who come into your homes for the safety checks, for the um, service, the installation, um, they're touching the customers um, firsthand. As a matter of fact, they're touching the customers more than the, the appliance manufacturers um, are touching the customers. And these really are sources of knowledge. Uh, so, you know, this is really the view from the trenches. And of course, these people have to be retrained and you have to have a way of feeding back the knowledge into the organization. But that's exactly what this company did. And I think you'd be surprised at what they've been able to do on the back of that knowledge. So here is um, the first thing. They first said they were going to be excellent in service. And the service really is what um, turned this around. But it went way beyond just providing good service. So the next app, here's, an, here's the example of the apps. Of course, there's service on it. Um, but you'll see right below service, uh, there's recipes. Why? Because for our core customers that are now the ones that are most important to define the brand, right? Some of the customers, and this is not just in terms of revenue, it really is to, to highlight what this brand is about. We have to be very, very close to these customers. Um, well, they love to cook. And I've talked to old ladies in Hong Kong um, who love to cook, and they love this brand. Um, not based on this app, but based on everything they've done since. So here's an example of one of the recipes. Um, then they decided to have a, if you think about the Nike flagship store, well, here's a gas supplier. They have a Hong Kong restaurant called Flame, where they have you know, fantastic food, um, where they have cooking classes, they bring in chefs from, from around the world and, and hold events. Everything to activate the brand. They uh, then decided to launch their own appliances, and they've also partnered with appliance manufacturers. They launched, based on their knowledge and learning, they launched their own line of kitchen, not just appliances, but uh, kitchens as a whole. As you'll see, they've won awards for both the appliances and the kitchens. They have now, if you think about what do they really own, what is at the core of their brand, it's the customer relationship. And they even sell them household insurance. They're so trusted that they sell uh, that they have one of the leading credit cards in Hong Kong. And so their whole business rev, uh, model has been turned around from being highly commoditized to highly differentiated. And here is an example. This is coming up in March uh, of this year. You can even get a diploma in culinary arts. Now, you might think this is ridiculous for a, a gas supplier, but think about the alternative. Think about competing on cost, being deregulated, and having to convince customers to stick with you because you're cheaper. Instead, what they have done is um, they've created a completely different brand. And here's an idea of a commercial that they're showing for one of their cookware. Masterpiece is about perfection. Okay, so uh, quite a different uh, kind of commercial than you would get from your regular gas supplier. And here's just a list of some of their awards. This is they're now in their fifth year of this turnaround. Uh, the top left-hand corner, they started out winning the service awards. 
um, in 2011, it's the first time they won the most trusted brand. They've won it again since. Uh, they've won all kinds of awards, including by some award uh, providers, the company of the year, the white collars most favored brand, um, which of course, you know, lots of cooks in that segment, um, but also in their B2B segment. So not just with consumers did they win awards. Um, they won all kinds of knowledge awards, meaning how did we take advantage of our customer knowledge? After sales service, service, best apps, best restaurant uh, in terms of Western cuisine, and also as part of this, and I want to highlight this, um, they're one of the most family-friendly uh, family friendly employers. And what's very important here is this is not just an outward facing exercise. It really started on the inside. It started with their employees getting their knowledge, their ideas, and really turning around the culture of the place in order to create a brand externally. So in terms of my brand traction model, just a couple of highlights uh, from what I talked about. Um, not only did senior management start this, but they continued to be involved. And um, all senior managers are part of customer-focused teams, and they visit customers twice a month. And I see this in organization after organization, is you cannot be making strategic decisions, leading the organizations, without spending face-to-face -face time with your customers. Um, the view from the trenches, some of the changes they made, they have a 24-hour service hotline, and they have five different languages uh, for each of the major ethnic groups in Hong Kong, and they have a real knowledge uh, system in place in order to garner that field data and turn it into... Connecting the dots, just some examples here. In order to kind of be singing of one hymn sheet to communicate better, they have a flatter organizational structure, and they've organized around the various customer segments, uh, the business segment, and also for their sort of, um, you know, the people who love to cook, their primary uh, segment. They uh, brand acts. I've already highlighted some of the um, moments that matter, but that includes the, at, at each of the visits, the, the service uh, technician will not just, you know, check the equipment. They have a series of questions they can ask, they can engage, they can give certain tips for cooking, um, if they see that the appliance is, is very dirty, they can give clips on cleaning and they can really engage with their customers. And of course, with Flame and the apps, Flame being the restaurant, um, they have all kinds of other signature um, interactions. The engagement is really about having a continuous culture change program and continuous training that um, gets their people engaged with the brand, not just their jobs. The brand practices, they have new values, which are customer focused, and they've really empowered the front line to make decisions then and there on the spot. And the front line certainly feels empowered that their knowledge has taken the company to where it is. In terms of the uh, tandem metrics, it's all about, you know, follow up calls with the consumers, maybe after a visit, after a phone call, through a closed feedback loop. And then connecting that to what we know about our custom, our own, I mean, our own employees. And now you can understand um, the link between employee engagement and customer engagement as well. Okay. The second value driver I mentioned was effectiveness. And what I've done here is I've given you a snapshot of what some of you will recognize as, I'm giving you a few seconds to think. I once had a participant say in my class, a fish. I don't know where he came up with this, but it's not a fish. It's uh, Michael Porter's value chain. And this was really kind of at the back end of that efficient effectiveness focus, which was um, the switch from the supply chain, which was all about creating the same level of output with less input, to thinking about given a level of input, how can I increase the output? So it was really a different way of thinking about uh, the world. And, and Michael Porter is somebody who summarized this, you know, this decades of change in industry rather well. So I'll come back to this value chain, but I thought I'd give you an example of, of effectiveness, how we think of it maybe on the product level. Now, one of the uh, first companies I spent time with uh, as a professor, this is when I was at MIT, uh, we we're right across the river, the Charles River in Boston. We're in Cambridge, and on the other side was the Hancock Tower, which is where they had Gillette's um, global headquarters. And this is one of the early Gillette uh, products. I spent about three weeks with them uh, uh, one summer. 
and I'll come to what I was doing with them then. Um, but you can think about the innovation from an effectiveness standpoint. What's better than one blade? Well, they came up with two blades, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and you might remember those old ads when the first you know, blade lifts the hair gently out of the follicle. The second one, you know, cuts it off. And then, um, and then um, the, the rest of the, you know, hair disappears below the surface of the skin. Super smooth baby skin. So um, then it took them seven and a half years and several hundred million in investments to come up with three blades. Now, this is absolutely fantastic because, um, you know, three has to be better than two. Now, I'm not sure what the third one does because... As far as I could tell, the hair, you know, disappeared below the surface of the skin, but maybe it's for exfoliation. But that's not really the point. This is uh, when I actually engaged with them at this point in time in the, in the late 80s, um, because within months of them coming up with third blade, they were out innovated. Um, Schick, some of you might know them as Wilkinson, came out with the Quattro, four blades. Now, Gillette was really besides themselves. How could they not see this coming? I mean, they've been out innovative. You know, if, you know, three blades, four blades absolutely has to be better. So, um, you know, they went back to work and it only took them five years. But wow, the fusion, five blades, actually six, technically speaking, that orange part at the top has another one. And um, it's probably late enough after my engagement with them. But, you know, I actually came up with an idea for them and you might see it in the future. <laughs> okay, you're hearing the laughter, not of myself laughing about my own <laughs> silly joke. <laughs> That's the other people in the room here. So um, that was the effectiveness viewpoint, but you can see how difficult it is to actually differentiate yourselves. That was a bit of a silly example. Here's an example of the financial services. If you you know, go to moneysupermarket.com here in the UK, right, you get offers which are exactly the same, the same interest rate, the same payment terms, everything is the same. There's very little differentiation. Um, here is, you know, Head and Shoulders and Boots, which is one of our, you know, retailers here with their store brand. Um, I'm not sure which one's which, and I actually like the Boots look a little bit better than the Head and Shoulders look. Um, here is, you know, I'm involved in the luxury sector, as, as I said in the beginning, I started the Wall Pro, Walpole program here um, and I had the LVMH luxury um, brand forms. And, you know, in this sector, Valentino, Paris, Hilton, I'm not sure you could tell um, without seeing the label. The same for Forever 21 and DVF. And, uh, you know, I thought this was quite a humorous moment when Apple showed the judge um, how similar Samsung looks to Apple. And um, even here in the high tech sector, you know, we're getting a very similar look between products. You even have a brand like Aldi. If you look at the products on the left and the right, um, they all look very much the same. Um, now, they're almost half the cost at Aldi, but really it would be very hard to tell the difference either in looks and probably also performance. And so here's an ad. I think uh, we'll come to the example. The next example is Pampers, but here's an Aldi ad for Pampers. We like these nappies. We like these nappies. And we like these nappies. We like these these ones, nappies. Have ones have won the awards. I like these. I like these. All right, so that was a, a bit of a humorous ad, but you can see how aggressively Aldi is going after the others with a, you know, the effectiveness focus that I started off with. I mean, the e efficiency focus, uh, that's what they really focus on. And it's very hard to actually uh, be more effective than any Aldi product. So um, if you think about Pampers, though, at the same time Aldi is running these ads and other brands, in 2001, they were a $3.4 billion brand and they were shrinking. Now, this is not a good sign because they're P&G's biggest brand. And if you've got a biggest brand that's shrinking, you've got investors uh, shouting out for P&G to spin out um, Pampers from the business. This is a true story. Um, but dial forward 10 years and in 2010, this is when they um, broke the $10 billion mark. And it was achieved entirely through organic growth. And I thought I'd just give you the, the picture here of Pampers and Huggies. 
Huggies actually overtook um, Pampers in the U.S. Um, and um, you know sold more diapers than Pampers. But you know I'm not sure this baby is you know the baby supermodel. It, to me, it looks almost the same. Um, but you know if I'm in the store, I'm really not sure uh, what the difference is here. So um, just to dial forward though, and this is not 2010, but this is um, here 2012 in in the UK. Kimberly Clark actually pulled Huggies from the market here. Now there's lots of reasons behind this, but one is really the fantastic turnaround that Pampers enjoyed around the world, as I said, entirely through organic growth. So let's see how they did this. And again, it started in a sense with a view from the trenches or the voice of the customer. And the idea was how can we connect dryness to something that is more meaningful to our customers? Now they used to connect dryness to sleep, right? Babies dry, it sleeps, you don't wake up. That's a bit selfish. Um, but when they did their research and really found out what do mothers truly care about? Well, they were obsessed with baby development. You know, some mothers were actually seen having, you know, headphones on their bellies, piping Mozart to their babies because they knew that would increase the, you know, the neural connections the unborn baby would develop. Um, um, they were also thinking of baby development from baby to toddler as stages. And these are quite powerful insights, as you'll see. And by the way, if you're wondering what that child is up there, that's baby Einstein. Um, that's how Einstein looked when he was a child. So that's the, the baby genius. And um, the other thing is, of course, the mothers felt insecure about whether they're doing the right thing. And that's the first time mothers in particular, which is really when you have the chance to make a a connection at the brand level because they likely to stick with the brand over time or if they realize it really doesn't matter they'll just go with the cheapest so here's an ad to show you how they took it and said you know sleep better sleep is and this is what the ad tells you Okay, so some of you, um, uh, I've seen the, the text you've been writing, some of you can't see the videos. That might have to do with the way you're looking at the, uh, the screen, but um, each of them will have, um, you can actually link to them afterwards on, on the web. I've given you the, the links for you to look at them afterwards as well. So um, the traditional communications, um, here's a shot from um, a, a picture from London. You know, it's all about baby development. This is sort of like the London tube map. These are all the different things baby does during the day. Now, that's still traditional marketing. Um, what's less traditional is then they thought about, well, let's create a web portal. And this is pampersvillage.com, and that's one of their early um, screenshots um, that they first started. And imagine your brand was at the level of dryness. I mean, you're not going to have a conversation with your customers about dryness, but baby development, well, they are willing to have a conversation, not just with you, but amongst each other. And uh, this, this portal is actually really appreciated by many mothers I've, I've spoken to. And this is the portal today. And you can see here the various products. Uh, you can now order photo big books through Pampers and all kinds of other services. Now, these are not to make money uh, necessarily. They're not extra lines of revenue. They're really ways of engaging customers. Um, but also directly they've come up with all over the world some pictures here from China from from Europe in terms of engaging their customers about what it feels like being a baby you see in the bottom right here in China she's trying to write with this massive pen because that's what it feels like how you write uh, when you're a baby you know all the furniture is super large to give you an idea of what it feels like to be a baby wonderful ideas that came out of that but more importantly you know in the bottom here you know, after, I don't know, 50 years of having diapers, they'd never really thought about diapers 
in terms of the stages, and they came out with all these different stages, which now, of course, has been copied by their um, by their competitors. But also in terms of the can-do line, it's no longer about dryness. It's about showering. It's about learning to you know go to the toilet by yourself, being independent. And their CSR is aligned. It's about uh, children, babies, and and in this case for vaccines um, all around the world. And I'll talk about some of the changes they made. The photo in the top left corner is their headquarters they moved into. Now, Pampers is a wonderful story. And in terms of top lead, I'll just refer you to Jim Stengel's book, Grow. Jim Stengel was the um, CMO, the global CMO at um, Procter & Gamble when they did this. And he has a whole chapter devoted to this story as well. Um, you know, a wonderful book. Uh, for all kinds of reasons. So, um, but if you want, that's where you can go. Um, in terms of the view from the trenches, one of the things, you know, here's a consumer packaged goods company where they really brought the trenches into the headquarters and all the consumer research is conducted on site, in the hallways, so to speak. So there's always babies around. Uh, so you can never forget why you're in business. It's about babies for the Pampers brand. A wonderful idea for a consumer company. Um, they align their own brand values with the values that mothers have in terms of brand acts. It was about these events, the Pampers Village website, their CSR, the brand engagement. Um, the headquarters was uh, parent and baby friendly. For example, they have on-site daycare, the whole colors, decor, you know, the parking spaces that are most convenient are not for the CEO. They're there for expecting mothers. In terms of the brand practices, and this was revolutionary for P&G, they're the first brand to stop doing some of these two-year rotations. Because if the brand is supposed to be different, uh, they wanted people to, to really be part of a brand, and they would not rotate them out if they were a good fit. Um, it used to be a very male-dominated engineering culture, and now they hire based on whether you have a passion for babies. Now, this is true even if you're an accountant, not just if you're in the marketing team. And in terms of these metrics, they really went to, from dryness uh, to good sleep perception metrics as well. Okay, so we're um, back to the value chain here from Michael Porter. And I just wanted to point out one thing about this value chain. And um, this is that um, I completely disagree with this conception of value creation. Um, now, that's a whole other um, seminar I could give. But the main thing is, if you think about where is the consumer in all of this, well, they're outside. We don't even think of them as a consumer, which is the, really the consumer experience, but we think of them as somebody paying for the value we created in the value chain. And we even reinforce this if we think about big data. We think about something like uh, the Tesco club card and, and that big data revolution. It's really data about transactions, not about consumption, but about transactions. And that then is fed back into the organization to make all kinds of decisions about the assortment, store opening hours, and so forth. But it has nothing to do with consumption, per se, or the nature of consumption. And that's really the point I'd like to make, and is that the real value is created through experience. It happens after the value chain. As a matter of fact, there is no value without the experience. And um, the example I often I, I often give is about um, Apple. When they came into, in, into the smartphone business, Nokia already had hundreds of functions on their phones, but nobody was using them. It was only by making them usable um, that Apple absolutely revolutionized the sector. And the leaders in the sector, which we had BlackBerry, Motorola, and Nokia, are all but dead um, at this time. So the example I'd like to highlight here is Southwest. You see their crazy um, CEO. He's sort of hanging onto the side of a plane here. Well, that's, that's pretty much top lead uh, as far as this goes. And their experience is, they call this the Southwest experience. Actually, these are elements from their website. And uh, it starts out with the little mouse you see here when they go on, on, on site. It then goes towards the shopping cart. When people arrive at the airport, that's a little ticket up there as they check in while they're on the flight and then also keeping in touch. These are all what they consider are moments that matter. And how can we better deliver the brand at each of these moments? 
Okay, so I'm going to give you just an example of what it actually means to fly on a Southwest airplane, and it's one of the you know in-flight announcements from uh, one of the flight attendants, and that's about delivering cheerful. Those of you that have flown us before know that we do things a little bit differently here on Southwest. Some of us tell jokes, some of us say, some of us just stand there and look beautiful. I unfortunately can do none of those. So here's the one thing that I do know how to do. We're going to shake things up a little bit. I need a little audience participation. Otherwise, this is not going to go over well at all. So here's, so here's what I need, what I especially need. you guys in the front, because you know what's coming. What's coming. All, right. All right, I need a beat. Need a beat. All, right. All right. All I need you to do is stop and clap, and, and I'm going to do the rest, because I just, I've had five, five flights today, and I just and cannot, cannot do the regular, regular boring, boring announcement again, again. otherwise I'm going to put myself to sleep. So, so. You guys with you guys me? With me? Yeah. All, right. All right. So give me a stomp, so stomp, clap, clap, stomp, stomp, clap. Come on, stomp, stomp, clap, clap, stomp, stomp, clap. There you go. Keep that going. This is right. 372 on SWA. The flight attendant's on board serving you today. Teresa in the middle. David in the back. Jason in the front. My name is David. And I'm here to tell you that. Shortly after taking off, I'm going to take off. First things first, then salt drinks and coffee to quench your thirst. But if you want another kind of drink, then just holler at me. Because I'm the best of the best. 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 I'm the best of
If you say top lead, they're the ones who lead the plane. And if they're not relaxed enough to put on a Bermuda shorts uh, for their interview, they certainly won't be relaxed enough to allow the flight team to be relaxed enough to have fun on the plane. So it's not enough to have the skills to fly a plane. You also have to have the right attitude. Um, so I just wanted to highlight of these seven steps here, um, the brand engagement part, um, because I think that's probably one of the hardest things to get right um, for organizations. Um, they, one of the few um, companies I know, they have a culture committee. They've had it for decades, which is really, you know, one of their three values is a fun-loving attitude, which is probably a bit different than many of your values, uh, which tend to be quite generic around, you know, innovation, quality, uh, and so forth. Um, but it's about really living that. And for them, it's important to keep that alive in the organizations. Also, their vendors and their corporate partners go through the culture and customer service aspects of their orientation program. They realize that the mid-management, and I've seen this in many organizations, is actually one of the most important audiences to get right. And they retrain them for uh, over a three-month period uh, about a decade ago to really get them right. And they called it Quest. And they have Request, which are their refresher courses that uh, managers go through every two years. And this is all about attitude. It's about culture. It's not about skills. And uh, even during a merger, and I thought I'd highlight this with Morris Air, they had a whole enculturation process called We're Serious About Having Fun. I've been through several mergers, and it's all about you know the financial due diligence. It's all about integrating systems. Yet you know half mergers fail, and most of them fail because of culture clash. Uh, yet most mergers do not pay attention to this either during the due diligence or in the immediate aftermath of the merger. Southwest does for them. It's very important. And you know back to top lead. Here is uh, their crazy CEO, their founding CEO, Herb Kelleher, um, on the. Um, cover of a Texas magazine. They started in Texas. And in his words, our people know what needs to be done, and they do it. Our culture is our true competitive advantage. And that's really the main message here is that to get brand traction, meaning action, the actual behaviors through our people, through everything we do at the moments that matter, um, culture is the ultimate differentiator for organizations. And that really means a different way of thinking about branding and brand building. So if you think about Southwest just as an example, I love that example because if you three things that differentiate them, right? They're cheap um, in terms of efficiency. They're on time in terms of effectiveness. Actually, they have to be on time in order to be cheap. That's one of the main reasons they are cheap. And then in the experience, it's about being cheerful. And that's what sets them apart from other low-cost carriers. So in terms of these three value drivers, here are some questions um, I'll just, uh, or some, some takeaways I'd like to end with. Uh, one is increasingly efficiency and effectiveness are becoming hygiene factors. That means you have to have them to succeed. You cannot be ineffective. You cannot be You have to have them, but they don't set you apart. The experience that you're offering to your customers is increasingly becoming the main differentiator. And I see this across every industry. This is also true, you know, we saw it for diapers. This is a packaged good. We see it in financial services. We even see it in B2B, um, oil and gas. It doesn't matter. And um, that's really the key takeaway. Regardless of which one is your main um, value driver, gaining brand traction, the seven steps I talked about, and I like to think of them, and, and we talk about them at the brand inside, as activating brand-led behavioral change is a lever for each of these value drivers. Okay? And finally, the takeaway here that I started with is that HR is becoming a formidable partner in branding, which is really about marketing, not just facing outside to the organization, communicating the brand promise, but turning around and partnering with HR in order to actually deliver on the brand promise. Okay, so that's uh, that's the webinar. Sorry about the little hiccup at the end for those who stayed online. And um, we are now ready for questions. So thank you very much, Nada. We've we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, so the first one came from Jessica Holdaway. Um, 
and we covered some of it with Southwest Airlines, but I wondered whether you had any other examples of engaging internal stakeholders to live the brand. Yes, um, that engagement process is it's, it's very much at the individual level. And I, we, we kind of have a model at the brand inside, we, which we call the six A's, but the short version is head, heart, and hands. Uh, you first have to get people you know, to understand what the brand is about, intellectually buy into this, that it's a good idea, and then emotionally engage. And that's really about the purpose of the company and, and you know, seeing what you are actually doing and in terms of providing value for your customers, getting an emotional sense for it. Um, but critically, what's often missing is then seeing what can I do differently um, in terms of delivering the customer experience. And that's about stepping outside and looking at the customer touch points and really thinking about, you know, getting the front line involved and saying, what could we do different here? Not just to satisfy our customers, but to actually live the brand. And um, that step is often missing. As a matter of fact, we often start with that because that allows you to uh, understand the kind of change you're talking about. Um, we've had a question from two people, thank you, um, from Sophia Nord and Eric Moll. What about B2B examples? Yeah. So I actually spent a, a lot of time in B2B um, on this issue. Town Gas is also an example of B2B that I started with. I just highlighted the consumer side of it. Um, for many years, one of our clients was Ericsson, where it was really about the transformation of you know, the big sort of tele telco infrastructure provider. How can we engage with consumers in this new uh, world? And uh, we did start it ground up and getting the people on the ground involved in the different locations around the world to think about you know, what does it mean to be a modern telco infrastructure provider, getting close to the customers, redefining the brand, and then actually they went to headquarters and convinced the top of the organization um, to think not just about technology, but to think about the customer experience and everything they do. And in partnering with the customers, um, they actually developed a whole different business unit uh, around new media on the back of this. So, um, you know, sometimes the brand word gets into in, in the way. I engaged with BP many years ago over this. And, you know, I started my presentation with a, with a slide which says B is for banana. We don't have to talk about brand here. We can, we can just insert the word strategy. And when we talk about traction, it's really about getting, you know, execution, getting traction for your strategy. It's just that brand, because it brings in the customer viewpoint from the outside, uh, is a real motivational force and it keeps the direction focused on where you deliver value. So this applies to any sector, really. So thank you again, Nada, and hopefully that answers your question as well, Louise Ferguson. Uh, just uh, a couple more. So had one, and we haven't got a name for this one, but how to enhance the experience in the FMCG category where the product is first? Yeah, and so that, that's actually one reason I used the Pampers example. And uh, so there's really two ways to think about it. The first one is even if you don't have any connection with your customers, you cannot actually deliver, I mean, develop the right kind of products without understanding the customer. So at P&G, you know, we really had a culture of people in white you know, lab coats thinking about you know, safety, thinking about dryness, and, and that's what they were excellent at. But without understanding the customer externally, they were not delivering on the right kind of innovation. So even if you never touch the customer in person, Behind the scenes, engaging, uh, engaging your, your R&D people into, in the brand actually has them come up with better innovation at the end of the day. So it, it really doesn't rely on having an experience where you touch your customer directly. It's also behind the scenes. Thank you. Um, one other question about how we can apply this. Great question from Tui Fransson, um, who works for a law firm. Mm -hmm. So how can this be applied with, within professional services? Um, so professional services, again, are, are not very different. Um, I don't have an example exactly of professional services. I have one of financial services, which hopefully will give you a, a, um, a way to think about this. So this is Ameriprise, which is a spin out from American Express. And uh, for years, they delivered retirement planning to the wealthy baby boomers with you know, focusing on wealth, 
focusing on you know mortality charts, all the legal aspects, um, and never really thinking about what their customers were actually buying. By understanding that these customers were worried most about their dreams retiring, which could be traveling the world, going back to school, starting a company after their regular careers were over, you know, they understood they had to deliver on something very different. And the key customer touch point was, of course, the financial planner. And what they developed was a dream book where they actually created a possibility for these planners to talk to their customers um, about their dreams, something they weren't equipped to do. So for a law firm, I think it would be the same. Why are customers really here? What are they doing when they're writing their will and engaging with customers on a more human level and then supporting your lawyers in order to act and interact um, based on that? Thank you very much. I'm afraid that we are now out of time. So I'd love to thank you for your fascinating and, and entertaining insights today. Thank you very much, guys. And I think I want a bottle of champagne. So I'll be toasting you all. I was just about to say, I've got the champagne on ice for you, Nada. Um, so as promised earlier, here are the dates of our future open executive programs, which Nada teaches on. Please do contact us for further information about these or any of the programs in our portfolio all of which you will find on our website, www.london.edu. If you would like to specifically find out more about the Transition into General Management program, you can sign up for our bite-sized webinar next Thursday, in which Michelle Jess will give an overview of the program, answer any questions, and review the best options for when you apply. Uh, you can register either by the, using the email addresses there or by clicking the link which says register now. Finally, thank you to everyone who's joined us online. Thank you for all your questions and comments along the way. And thank you for bearing with us with the video. Um, obviously, we're going to send these out and the links are in the PowerPoint presentation that we will send out. We hope to see you at London Business School very soon. In the meantime, stay in touch. And have a great day. Thank you.